Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you could join us on this cold Thursday evening. It's uh, warm here in the studio and we're going to have some conversation about the public policy issues that face Minnesota. We want you to be a part of that conversation, hence the catchy name of the program, Your Legislators. So we want you to call in and give our legislators, your legislators, some questions to answer. The number and uh, email addresses and so forth will appear on your screen and we look forward to hearing from you. As you know, we come to you uh, each week from now until when the legislature goes, uh, goes home, sometime in the end of May, and between now and then we hope to have an opportunity to visit with nearly everyone who uh, represents a piece of Minnesota. We begin this evening by introducing our guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. And we, as we do each week, we begin to my immediate left, joining us from District 66B from St. Paul, Representative John Lesh. Representative Lesh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, Barry, I'm from St. Paul. I'm a prosecutor for the city of St. Paul. <coughs> uh, this is my sixth term in the legislature. I chair the Civil Law Committee. I serve on Judiciary, Public Safety, and Taxes. And uh, you're doing... A what kind of prosecution for our viewers? Uh, I do misdemeanor prosecution, so anything from uh, your standard run-of-the-mill bar fight to uh, prostitution, <laughs> DWIs, and uh, resisting arrest. And at, at the risk of creating problems, that in fact is uh, my background as well. I spent a number of years practicing in the Hutchinson area and also doing misdemeanor prosecution. So we'll bore everybody. We'll talk shot. No, we won't. We'll go on. We'll, we'll go on to the rest of the program, maybe later. Uh, joining us a regular with our program, been with us many times over the years. We're delighted that she comes back to us uh, once again from District 45, New Hope, uh, Senator mm -hmm. Ann Rest. Senator Rest, good to have you with us again. Tell our viewers a little bit about well, yourself. Well, thank you, Barry, and it is a pleasure to, um, uh, to return and, and have a chance to have conversation with you and with my, and with my colleagues. I, <clears throat> uh, this term, I've been in the Senate for a while. This term, I'm chairing the Tax Reform Division of the of the Tax Committee. Uh, I also serve on the Transportation uh, and Public Safety Policy and Finance um, Division and also the State Government and Veterans uh, Finance Division as well as the Election Subcommittee in, in the House. And um, one of my passions is uh, capital preservation and I'm really pleased to serve on the Capital Preservation um, commission, and we're hoping to move forward once again this year with um, this uh, multi-year project. Senator Rest, we've had <clears throat> conversations about taxes over the years many times. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about your background in that area. It, uh, it's a little more extensive than just simply serving on the committee, I believe. Well, I'm, I'm a retired uh, CPA and had a uh, small tax practice, and previous to that uh, worked for a CPA firm. Um, and um, have a graduate degree in tax policy and tax law from the um, university. Well, as I said, it's a little broader than simply serving on the committee, and so I'm, we're delighted that uh, you can be with us this evening because I think we will be talking a little bit about taxes so. before we're done. <laughs> uh, it's lawyer night at the, uh, at the <laughs> stage here at your legislators. Also joining us is another attorney from District 58, Lakeville, Senator Dave Thompson. Senator Thompson, delighted that you could join us. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, Barry, thanks for having me, and I live in Lakeville. My district is uh, Lakeville, Farmington, and a large part of Southern Dakota County. I uh, am in my second term. I was elected the first time two years ago in 2010. I uh, serve as the ranking member of Senator Rest Committee mm -hmm. on the Tax Division, and then I'm also on the, the full tax committee, as well as state and local government and education policy and uh, very glad to be here and have an opportunity to discuss these issues. Thanks for having me. Well, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, Senator Thompson, actually, we, we, you know, I have 
limited experience in the in the radio and television business. Senator Thompson is our veteran, so if we have any questions about that, we'll we'll look to your direction there as well. Finally, uh, another regular, been with us many times over the years, from Cedar, District 31B, Representative Tom Hackbarth. Mr. Hackbarth, good to have you with us again. Hey, thank you for having me again. Uh, uh, I'm State Representative Tom Hackbarth. I represent Northern Anoka <laughs> County, uh, five cities and one township, and uh, I'm starting my uh, ninth term. And I serve on the Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee, the uh, Environment Policy Committee, Energy Committee, which I was the chair of last year, and uh, uh, and I'm the lead on the energy or the environment policy committee this year, and uh, I'm also on ways and means. Uh, my areas of interest are hunting and fishing and outdoor recreation, outdoor fun, I like to call it, <laughs> uh, all those kinds of uh, things. Uh, you know, motorcycling and ATVing and snowmobiling, all those things are great. And uh, look forward to looking at some of those issues this year. Uh, maybe uh, tweaking wolf hunting, some of those things, and. Uh, uh, other areas of interest uh, have to do with uh, Racino and gaming and those things. Your background outside the legislature. Sure I sold difference. auto parts for 34 years and uh, I'm a volunteer firefighter. I did some uh, 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 instruction at Hennepin Technical Centers for quite a while. All right, well, uh, I want to remind our viewers to call in with questions uh, as we're waiting for those questions to come in. I think we should probably begin our program talking a little bit about the major news for the week, which is, of course, the governor's budget proposal. And um, for no apparent reason except that Senator Rest, the governor, did talk about taxes. Let's start with you and uh, give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the governor's proposal, your reaction to it, your thoughts, and then we'll kind of go around the table and see what people have to say about it. So go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Barry. Well, you know, the governor has, I think, offered probably the, um, the boldest budget that we have seen in any number of years. And the, um, uh, there certainly is a lot of tax reform in it, and there is a, um, I think there, there's a real movement toward having um, an honest discussion about how we are going to fund those things that Minnesotans want, need, uh, or, and or demand. And he's doing it with, uh, without any of the gimmicks, without any of the, um, uh, as far as I can see, I mean, it's going to be a huge effort to get through the bill uh, and the bills, but um, without the one-time um, borrowing, without the one-time um, gimmicks, and it's been a while since we've had a budget approach that did that, and certainly um, uh, the legislature for the last 10 years, and it's not, not Republicans or Democrats, but uh, the legislature and, as um, the two bodies have... Um, embraced um, uh, one-time solutions, gimmicks, um, uh, timing um, situations, uh, you know, throwing things back and forth uh, in order to have what I believe is an artificial balance. And uh, the governor is, um, I think, taking on the responsibility of uh, putting that aside and working so that by uh, 2017, we can uh, have fully repaid the school districts, but also uh, we will have uh, dealt with uh, the structural deficit. Senator Thompson, your thoughts? Well, uh, first off, I'm in agreement with Senator Rest on, on trying to find one-time money to solve budget problems. And in fact, even though the Republicans running the legislature and a Democratic governor ended up there, uh, in the last budget cycle, I don't think it's the right way to do business. So from that perspective, I, I agree with the governor's approach. The problem is that, I, and I think something that was really a surprise to us Republicans genuinely is this governor has talked a lot and, and you know, Democrats did nationally and here in Minnesota about trying to, quote, tax the rich and find the 2% and get their money. I think the thing that's shocking to me is looking at the $2.1 billion net increase in sales tax. And Senator Rest and I had a, a good discussion in her office about the fact that I'm for tax reform and changing things. I think there's an argument to be made for broadening the base and, and doing some different things, but not if it's going to take $2.1 billion net out of the pockets of the people of Minnesota. And make no mistake about it, that's not a tax on the rich. That's a tax on everybody in Minnesota, directly and indirectly. Directly through things like uh, 
taxes on services such as oil changes when you have your car maintained, haircuts, uh, obviously clothing, those kinds of things. Um, and then indirectly, and then a lot of these business to business taxes just get passed on. So I think the shocking thing to me was that this governor talked about hitting the rich, and I'll tell you, every Minnesota is going to get whacked uh, if our budget ends up to be anything like the governor has proposed, and I don't think that's good for people, and it certainly isn't good for the economy. Representative Hackbar, two points. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I want to get back to the spending issue. This is really about spending. It's not so much about the tax increases. Uh, it, it's about the additional spending that uh, the governor wants to t do in this budget. Uh, he, we wouldn't need to be raising the taxes if it wasn't about increasing the spending. Really, it has to be about spending. That's what we need to be talking about here. Uh, let's look at the budget and what the Republicans did with the governor last biennium. We're sitting pretty good right now with this tw uh, ending in 2013, uh, this biennium. We're going to have a surplus. And if you look out in the out years for the upcoming uh, biennium, we continue, we always continue to bring in additional revenue. We're going to be pr bringing in additional revenue in the next biennium. Uh, we had in Ways and Means uh, last week when the commissioner was in, I think he said it was somewhere, it was somewhere between 2 and 5 percent projected increase in revenue for the next biennium. So, um, and, and yet we're looking at a, a deficit in the out years. Uh, the deficit that we're looking at is about the projected spending. If we can reduce that spending to the increase that we're expected to bring in, we're going to have a balanced budget. We don't need to be raising taxes. So uh, I have, I, I, I'm starting my ninth term. I have not been in the legislature yet when we've actually reduced the base. We haven't done that. We always talk about cutting. And in this budget, the governor's talking about making some spending cuts. He hasn't made any spending cuts. He hasn't touched the base. He's just like the Republicans did the last two years. We cut the increases. We didn't cut into the base. We have to get to cutting out some of this ridiculous spending that we have to do in this state. It has to start there. Um, it's all about the spending. Now, let's get back to that. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, an increase in spending here. Uh, just the sales tax alone uh, is going to be uh, $2.1 billion additional revenue to the state. And where is all this money going to go? I mean, what do, what's the additional uh, spending that we have to do that, uh, Senator Rest, that you said needs to be done? I don't understand where that has to be done. I mean, the state's running very, very well right now. The budget that we passed two years ago, ending up with a surplus. And, and, and Senator Rest, you talk about there's no gimmicks in this bill. There absolutely is gimmicks in this bill, or in this proposed budget. Uh, maybe in the end, when the House and the Senate get together and work this thing over, maybe there won't be any gimmicks. But in the governor's proposal, there are gimmicks. He pushes off the, the shift until 2017 before we pay it back, before we start to pay it back. That's part of the gimmicks that they were talking about. Our budget, we actually paid back with the last uh, budget that we did. We paid back what the Republic, what we were chastised for in the last election. We actually paid back everything that we borrowed from the school shift, plus some of what the previous biennium that the Democrats borrowed from the school shift, we paid back some of that, and that's been paid back to the schools already. So I don't know where we have this problem where we say we need more revenue, we need more taxes, and that's what this is all about, more taxes for additional spending. It's about the spending, and that's what we should be talking about. Senator Rest, do you want to respond since he invited well, I mean, you to do so? I'm just checking off everything he said there. <laughs> okay. um, well, I obviously dispute a number of things he said, uh, but when you talk about spending, the, we are looking at um, – $1.4 billion in property tax relief. Um, I think Minnesotans do need that. I think property taxes have uh, gone up, what? Uh, Senator you know, Rest, triple, Senator cut, Rest sir, what does the state have to do with property taxes? Uh, well, we have um, passed policies and mandates, um, demands on local governments that have increased them by, uh, what, hundreds of millions of dollars in the last decade. Um, and we know that Minnesotans really, I think, uh, resent, if you will, uh, the property tax mo almost more than any other tax. And um, I think we're, we're committed, along with the governor, to um, um, providing property tax relief. You may call it spending. I call it reducing the burden of one of the most regressive taxes that we have 
for, um, for homeowners. Uh, Minnesota is known uh, over the decades for uh, placing, placing a high priority on, um, uh, on, home, on home ownership. And I think that the governor is, um, is recognizing that value and making, um, and making good on it. Can he do everything in this budget uh, in the next two years? Uh, no, no, nobody can. But I think that he's, um, he's made a good, bold start. And, um, and uh, I'm willing to uh, work with him to get, uh, to get a good result. I'm impressed with what the governor has done. There's no question, Representative Hackbar, the state economist has made clear that over the amount of time we've cut local government aid, property taxes have gone up, and he stated that they are linked. Absolutely, but they're linked. Lesh, they're connected. But Representative Lesh, the of who is raising those property taxes? He has stated you, you, can, you can shift the blame, Representative Hackbarth, but we're here, we should say the buck stops here. It does have to be responsible with someone. You can't say it's the fault of the county commissioners, it's the fault of the city councils. When it comes down to it, when you're short sheet in their bed consistently and they still have to pay for police and fire, they still have to pay for local jails, they still have to pay for the local services, that has to come from somewhere. You can't just wash your hands while Rome burns. Representative At the end Lesh, of the day, there are communities when in my area Governor that Dayton have balanced their budgets a budget accordingly. That says, 500 per family property tax credit in order to relieve this burden, this burdensome proposal that Senator Russ just talked about, and the additional local government aid that this spending, you talked about spending, that spending to ensure that families can actually afford the homes they live in and still get the police services, the fire services. You're a volunteer fireman. You understand that people rely on the fact that they're going to live in a safe community. It's a core function of government. What can you count on if you can't count on the fact that a fireman or a, fire, a, a firefighter is going to show up at your home when it's burning or that you can call there's actually going to be a reasonable amount of response time? This budget is bold. There's no question it's bold. And it's, it's the obligation of the GOP as the opposition to poke holes in it. Absolutely, I get it, I understand it. But one thing that you cannot say is that this budget kicks the can down the road like has been going on for the last 10 years. Minnesotans are sick of that. They won't tolerate it. It makes a lot of changes in property taxes and in the tax system as a whole to ensure, you know, we have to do something. So if it's not this, you need to come up with a comprehensive solution that Minnesotans will buy into. Because right now, this is the plan on the table, and it's a great first step forward. Just briefly, I'd like to cover a couple things. I agree with Representative Hackbarth that the spending is the problem. And obviously, taxes are driven by a need to generate sufficient revenue to cover spending. With respect to the property tax relief that, that Senator Rest and, and Representative Hackbarth were talking about, the problem, as I see it, Senator Rest, is that we don't control what local governments do in terms of, of raising taxes. So uh, we're going to, um, you know, give this $1.4 billion of, of property tax relief, but local governments can reinstitute that. We don't have control over the ability to do that. So if your perspective is that mandates and things that we've shoved down to lower governments and required them to do is the problem, then my view would be we should relieve those things rather than providing what ends up being state spending uh, and, and could result in, it could come right back into the budgets in, in the state government. And as far as local government aid goes, I think it's really important, Barry, to go back to the, to the initial purpose of local government aid, and that was to help communities that have insufficient population and infrastructure to provide the basic things that they need, such as maintenance of their city streets, shoveling the walks in the winter and those kinds of things. Unfortunately, it has been co-opted by Minnesota's largest cities so that Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, Duluth are the largest recipients of local government aid. So it has become a, a, a situation where the areas of the state with the biggest political clout are getting the money, not the cities that need it. That's the problem with local government aid. It's, it, it's actually become a welfare system for our cities, and uh, they're depending on it. And uh, Representative Lesh, like I tried to say, say these cities have depended on it, and in my area, they've adjusted accordingly. If they're not getting the money that they need, they've cut their budget. They're not cutting fire and police like a lot of communities that I know do, uh, but they they're are focusing on the core issues that the, city, that the people in the city need. They're cutting other areas of government. They're not expanding their spending like so many cities want to do. And with this local government aid, they start to get it again, and you start funding it and, and feeding the beast again. Um, they're going to expand their spending on other issues, just like 
uh, this governor and this legislature wants to do in this budget. They want to expand the spending, do more spending. The devil's in the details. And when you, when you say that there's a spending problem, yet you, can't get around the facts. Problem. you can't get around the facts that the cost of government has steadily declined during the time that I've been in the legislature. The average person spends less of every dollar they earn on the cost of government in the state of Minnesota that now than they did 10 years ago. That is a fact. So when you say it's a spending problem, people are getting a more efficient deal. If you want more, you can make that pitch, but you have to recognize the fact that people are getting a better deal than they used to. Now, with respect to local government aid, there's no question, absolutely. City, cities like Minneapolis-St. Paul, with aging infrastructure, with uh, growing uh, burdens with respect to pension liabilities, yes, absolutely, we do have needs. St. Paul, one-third of our tax base is gone because we have the universities that we love to school your kids at our universities. We love to, absolutely. But they don't pay into our property tax base. Neither does all the government buildings we have here. Neither do the religious institutions. It's supposed to recognize those kinds of things as well. So we appreciate that it's a shared responsibility, not just in the metro area, but statewide. We take care of people so that they have the same level of services, and some people aren't left out in the cold. You know, I, I, I would add that I think we need to be very, very careful to... Uh, to make local governments out to be the villains uh, and local uh, government officials, whether they're school boards or county county commissioners or um, or city council members or, or mayors, you know, when when uh, when your constituents go to vote, and I've said this many times, um, and they vote for you and they elect you, and you think they made a wise decision, <laughs> but those same constituents when they go to vote for city council members, they don't all of a sudden get stupid in terms of who they are choosing to, um, uh, to run their community. So, you know, let's be really careful about uh, talking about profligate uh, local governments. It's just not true. Most uh, of the local governments in our state are run very, very well. And I agree with you, Senator people. Rest. Well, you were really going after them. I'm not going after, after the people well, in my community. Well, the people in I my know. community. You were, going after the, you were saying the, pe the mayors in my communities? Oh, I'm contraire. saying that city governments have to budget accordingly instead of just continually well, spending all the time. Let's talk a little bit of a little different wrinkle on this tax issue because we've got viewers who want to weigh in on this. A viewer from Bagley says they really like this idea of a sales tax to handle the deficit and anything else that might be out there. A viewer in Duluth says well, we should replace the property tax with an expanded sales tax. A viewer in Little Falls is uh, on a fixed income and says putting a tax on food and clothing sounds like a really bad idea to, uh, to that viewer. And then we have another viewer from unidentified town who says they don't want taxes to go up, period. Well, let's talk about the sales tax piece because that's a proposal that has been kind of that's kicked around a little bit about expanding it to clothes and services and so forth, and this governor has formally proposed it, and uh, maybe we'll take uh, take a little uh, you know, I, that. You know, I think what has really been interesting about the governor's proposal and, and is that um, although we, all, we expect it because it's what he ran on uh, in, when he was running for governor, to uh, propose uh, a, um, a tax increase on the 2% on the, on the income tax on the fourth tier. And yet, what is getting the most chatter now is the differences and the, the, uh, the reforms that he is proposing in the, in the sales tax. And I think that's come as a surprise to, to almost all of us. Um, but I think what he's moving toward is a, um, is the recognition that we are indeed in a, in a different economy now than, than our parents were, or your grandparents maybe, uh, <laughs> that uh, where the basket of goods is no longer hard goods. It, the basket of goods in our, uh, for, for each of our families is far more involved in services. Uh, you spoke earlier about uh, taxing the oil change. Well. Uh, uh, most of our families probably did that for themselves. Uh, they bought the oil, they paid tax on the oil, and, um, and they, uh, they changed their own oil. Now we pay somebody to do that. That's, that's the difference in what's, in the, what's in, the, uh, uh, in the basket of goods. And so our economy and the, and the tax policy in it has to recognize that we've gone from a hard goods economy to a, a service economy, and the participation of consumers in that economy has to be 
recognized just as it was 50 years ago, and we're behind in that. So this notion of looking at um, broadening the base, uh, wider than I proposed in my, in, my, uh, in, in my proposals that have gone forward, but widening the base and, and lowering the rate, um, economists tell us over and over again that that leads to a, a, stable, um, a stable tax system and a stable economy. And we know that this three-legged stool that we've had before where it was one-third property taxes, one-third sales, one-third income um, to, um, uh, to run our state on, that that has gotten really, really lopsided with over 40, 45 percent of the revenues coming in, coming in from the property tax system, which is the most regressive. Um, we're going to be looking at all of the, the proposals in that context, but the notion of a broad base and a low rate, um, I don't think anyone would deny is, um, is a pathway to um, a stable tax Senator system. Senator Thompson, thoughts? You know, Senator Rest, um, I've taken some grief from I my base. I know, you've been good. Um, <laughs> in, in that I, I don't disagree that we have a changing economy mm -hmm. and we have to look at things differently. The problem I have is that what the governor is proposing is not just reform, it's a massively huge middle class tax increase. And that is, to me, problematic for individual well, families in Minnesota. you need to take Minnesota. a look at the whole thing, you though. Do. I mean, you talk about it, it's a massive tax increase, but on some of the things that they're paying then, the sales tax on now, it's going to go down over 2 percent. And Senator uh, Thompson, I have to say. And the, and the property tax relief. Uh, where, who is that going to? It's going to middle that, class homeowners. But you're bringing in more yeah. money. You're bringing in $2.1 billion more money. But you're offsetting right. I mean, that with the payments off for property tax relief. It doesn't also, equal out. It's still also, more money that you're bringing in. It's additional the money out. for well, additional spending. After we've dug a hole for the past 10 years and failed there's to solve no the hole. problem, absolutely there's a hole. You'll take a look at it. You take a look at where our courts are. You take a look at where their pu public defenders are in the public safety area. People are suffering. Staff is down. Cost of government is down. Absolutely. And businesses, when you look at it, it if a business comes in and says, hang on, what so are you, you doing here? Suddenly, I have to pay for uh, all these taxes I wasn't paying before. Oh, you had no tax liability before? I can't wait for those folks to come in front of tax committee and say, this is unfair. I used to not pay any taxes. Now I actually have to pay my fair share. It's unfair. The, when the, the governor cuts out these tax loopholes and says, okay, we're reducing the overall corporate tax rate, at the same time we're cutting out the loopholes, these businesses overall may pay some, some sales taxes they weren't paying before, but between the property tax relief and the other reduction to taxes, they're going to be better off. Plus, we're going to have a high service state that they can be proud to live the, in. The problem is, Representative Lesh, that you're obfuscating because you're making it sound as though no, that there's not a net increase in taxes. There is a net increase in taxes to feed the governor's spending. And so you talk about the relief to middle class families with property tax, $500 a year. My understanding is that's to everybody. So it's not just to the middle class. If you take the, the sales tax increase and divide it out by the number of Minnesotans, it represents $389 for every man, woman, and child in this state. So a family of four, they may get their $500 tax relief, which they may or may not get because local governments may turn around and increase that, not saying that they will, they may but that represents almost $1,600 per family in sales taxes. So the, the problem is the growing government, and I, I think, Senator Rest, you're exactly right. The governor ran on raising taxes on the wealthy. That didn't surprise anyone. I was genuinely surprised to see what he has done to the middle class, and it's disturbing to me. And as far as all these business-to-business -business classes, Senator Rest, you are amply trained to know mm -hmm. that those get passed on to individuals. when when the local Ace Hardware has to pay more for their attorney to set up their corporation or, or do something to their business or pay their accountant more to, to, for their tax uh, uh, returns to be done. That ends up either get, getting passed on to consumers and employees. The cost of government is going up. It's taking money out of the private sector, and they're taxing the middle class to do it. That is not a good recipe for economic growth or helping families. Senator, what's good of, for the, the goose? The price of government is not going up. It's been going down ever since we uh, started uh, calculating that particular uh, uh, statistic. And so, be, you know, be careful. It is a term of art because it's in the statute how it's defined. But um, I think you have to be careful about that. You know, some people's, quote, spending 
is other people's investing. And of course, uh, you're going to hear a lot of Democrats talking about investing in Minnesota. So when you talk about spending, I talk about investing in our children, investing in making sure that we are paying attention to all the research that we have heard over the years that we've only paid lip service to. And that is about educating and providing um, resources for um, the really little ones, the four-year-olds, to be ready to go to kindergarten, to invest in all-day kindergarten uh, for parents that choose it um, so that we can really have a literate um, Minnesota educated workforce, which is what we need for the jobs, you know, and, and to talk about the business economy. Uh, what happened today? You know, such everything is so terrible and bad and whatever. Pinnacle. Pinnacle is coming to Minnesota and is going to headquarter here. That's how bad the, uh, uh, the business climate is, even in the face of their knowing. They certainly have to know um, uh, what kind of principles, budget principles, this governor is, is proposing. So you I was can talk about spending. Today, I want to talk about investing. I was reminded today, and I read an article by Dane Smith, who used to be a reporter for the Star Tribune, and he quoted the, the Oscar Wilde quote about people who seem to know the cost of everything but the value of nothing. What do we want here in Minnesota? What's the value that we provide to you to be a citizen of Minnesota? And historically, we were very proud. I grew up understanding that we had the best roads. You always knew when you drove across the road into Iowa. Well, now you know when you drive across the border into Iowa because the roads are better over there. You always knew we had a world-class education system. You knew your kid could get the best schooling. What do we provide you now? What do we get except for the weather outside right now? We need to make sure Minnesotans are proud to live here. Well, you know, uh, we, we have been increasing uh, education funding in the last few years. Last year we gave uh, an additional $50 on the formula. Mm -hmm. and, and Senator Rest, we could take that uh, additional $50 right now, uh, an additional $50 in the education budget, and do all-day kindergarten. Right now we could do that. We don't have to raise taxes to we do can't, that. We can't make the investment, however, in, um, in getting rid of what we call the cross <coughs> subsidy in special education, which the governor is uh, proposing. Senator putting Rest, money we in. can't do everything all in one year. You, I know you and, and the House representatives and the governor want to do that, and you're going to do it all in this next biennium. You know, just you're going to fix bit all ago, you, the problems. You, you said the governor had a gimmick about the 2017 payback. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but He's just pushing so it off to not, 2017. We're not trying to do it all in one year, but he pays for it in 2017. Let's talk a little bit about it issue that you raised, which is the early childhood education piece, mm -hmm. Casey. Um, and I think, Senator Thompson, you told us earlier you served on education policy. So uh, can you maybe let's move in the direction of the early childhood piece. That's been around in uh, past legislative sessions. Uh, uh, it's had some support in various corners. What's your view on the governor's proposal on that issue? Well, once again, I think it, it boils down to what we want to pay for and what we, we value paying for. Uh, I don't think there's any question that uh, we're going to continue to see early childhood education paid for in this state. I frankly um, have some concern. I believe that the, the best folks to raise children and get them to the age to start school are parents. And, and, and you know, I, I know that, that some people see this as, as impolitic to say, but that which you tax, you get less of, and that which you subsidize, you get more of. And we are subsidizing a lot of people who are choosing, not that they're incapable, they're choosing to, uh, you know, uh, essentially abdicate their their parenting duties and and get the state to pay for it. And I don't I don't know that that's a direction that we want to go entirely. Uh, I think we really need to put responsibility on parents to raise children. We know that those give us the best outcomes, and um, I don't think that we need to put ourselves in a situation where we're we're serving as parents through government uh, almost from the time a kid comes home from the hospital. We're in a global economy. We are competing with kids in Asia. We're competing with kids in Europe. We're competing with kids relatively soon. We're going to be competing with kids in South America and Africa. There's no question we need to look at the future of how our kids are educated. I understand your perspective, Senator. There's the tendency to want to be traditional about this, and you're taught at home, but the fact is, when kids in other countries are getting a leg up on us, uh, we got to watch out for that. And also, when, when it's established that early childhood 
is returning seven dollars to one spent on how we do overall with future performance you can't ignore those numbers you can't ignore them at all it's a direction we have to move in well maybe we have to go in a direction of uh, performance based funding maybe we should uh, give increased funding for schools and school districts that uh, do a better job of getting their kids educated. I guess it depends on what you mean by performance. There's no question about it because at every level if you give high stakes testing and this is where the drop off is. I mean I think in general uh, Representative Hack Hackbarth we're going to agree on that. You don't want to throw throw money at a problem and say okay well with a bigger program it's, it's going to work and we've had 10 years of cutbacks to cut back the programs that aren't working but I think in general you're absolutely right correct there should be expectations I think we as legislators are in a good position to evaluate that as well whether they're doing it whether they're delivering the jobs to industry that we need here in Minnesota that have historically relied on our good education well, and historically that's just what we've been doing is throwing money at the problem well let's talk about some specific questions that viewers have uh, one of the great things about this program is that our viewers pay attention to what you folks are doing and so uh, uh, they uh, they have some thoughts that they uh, want to share with us we have a viewer from Hutchinson who wants to know about um, a bill that uh, Senator Bach sponsored in 2010 dealing with um, an incentive retirement bill that saved uh, 41 million dollars he thought this was a good idea is there any talk about doing that this budget session I don't vouch for our uh, our viewers' numbers, but uh, but what about uh, what about those kinds of employee issues? Anybody know anything about that? I don't I don't recall the bill. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't either. I can't help. All right, any, any thoughts? All right, um, we have another very specific question um, dealing with uh, the Boundary Waters Drainage Work Group. Um, and this is a bill um, dealing with. We have the, the wrong legislators. Well, you know, I, I, I just <laughs> asked. That's right. That's right. It's uh, good viewers. Where is Bill Ingebrigtsen when you need yeah, him? Right there. <laughs> so does anybody here know about the Boundary Waters Drainage Work Group? No. Okay. No if not, we'll we'll, uh, we'll pick on next week's group and we'll ask him about that. So uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Okay. What about K twelve education? Uh, what's going on with that from this budget session? Obviously, the governor made a proposal. Let's start with you, Representative Lesh, and then. Uh, uh, kind of flesh that out a little well, bit and where you I think 600 million he's talking about overall about uh, 340 million going towards e12 and the balance going toward higher education which essentially is a good start a as has been pointed out abs yes the the shift has not been paid back in this but when I talk to educators about what we're actually looking at to do with this I'm impressed I think the governor has 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 made a good decision now with all that's been cut over the course in, in whatever we're talking about, I, I, some legislatures we've attempted to, to, to keep E12 harmless, um, I think we really need to look at how we ramp up. And the devil is always, of course, in the details of this. If there's $340 million, where is it? how we're going to get there, and what are the specific things that are going to be added back in. In general, though, I like it. I like the look of it. Well, you know, um, one of the things that, that we're having right now too in our discussions we we can talk about numbers and total numbers but you're you're absolutely right about the devil in the details uh, as the um, the governor's uh, folks are preparing to present the proposals to um, uh, to the various committees and the tax committee next next Tuesday the um, what we really need to see and I'm as eager as anyone to see it is the actual language in the bills that he's proposing so that we um, our pencils are sharp his pencil is sharp and we absolutely understand the implications of his proposals through statutory language and uh, and that's no more true in um, in an LGA formula it's not enough to say for example that we're going to get property tax relief um, th through um, a local government aid and county aids at the at the level that the governor is proposing um, but we need to know that the formula that's going out so that uh, so that communities that have um, uh, a good tax base uh, are not ones that are going to be getting uh, getting dollars that are not needed for them to deliver the services the same thing I think can be applied to the specifics of the education proposals as well it's not just the overall number it's uh, it's where it's being uh, delegated and and allocated allocated I think uh, when you look at the budget, as, as Representative Hackbarth actually accurately pointed out, we increased the budget last year, and then when we shifted, we added on a little bit to compensate districts so they could pay the interest on the on the debt that they would incur. The, but the thing is, our educational systems deficiencies are not the result of lack of funding. 
and that is demonstrated by the fact that the schools in our state that have the best fund, the highest levels of funding are not necessarily the highest performing schools and school districts like my own where we uh, really take it on the chin in the way uh, in the way schools are funded are doing well. There are other factors involved. So we, you know, the, this word reform is thrown around a lot to the point that it almost becomes meaningless. But we do need change. And to me, one of those changes is I'm not frankly concerned about the students in my district. In Lakeville, Farmington, and the smaller towns around, I just spoke at a National Honor Society induction in Randolph a few weeks ago, one of the best schools in the country. They do a phenomenal job. I'm concerned about the students in Minneapolis and St. Paul and other areas that are in, in schools that are not doing well and because of the structure we have don't have realistic alternatives for parents to get their students out of there. So the reform needs to be increasing competition, increasing access uh, to schools that are performing well for parents that are, are have their children in struggling schools and it's become very popular to talk about the achievement gap, which of course is the distance between the performance of white students and minority students. And ironically, the very folks who seem the most concerned about that are the ones who want to prevent disproportionately m minority students from having good educational uh, alternatives, and that's very unfortunate. Well, I have to say, I, I appreciate, um, uh, Senator, your concern for, for students in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I saw Rex Hackmarth nodding at that too, and I appreciate it. I, I, I hope that you understand um, that when you talk about uh, getting students out of there uh, of what you consider underperforming schools, that you understand the factors. And I wonder if you had uh, the concentrations of poverty in Lakeville, if you had the special uh, education uh, concentration of students uh, in Lakeville, if you had the English language learners in Lakeville. I wonder, I wonder how those schools would be performing. And, and I appreciate it and I understand it, but the inner city absolutely has a unique set of problems that you can't just make go away by closing down the schools and fanning them out to other districts or other areas. We have charter schools uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul that do this as well, but the special types of needs that we have impact those rates of success in a different way. It has to be recognized. Barry, if I may respond yeah, to that. We all acknowledge that. Obviously, different school districts due to, to demographic issues have different challenges and the like. But the fact is uh, that does not justify creating a system in which those who, who would seek alternatives uh, that are competitive don't have the opportunity to do it. And we all believe in almost every area, except seemingly education, that iron sharpens iron. As you compete, as you have school districts and private schools, public schools and the like competing, we believe in other areas of the economy that that, that would help everybody and, and create better schools and create new and better ideas. Instead, we create what is in effect a monopoly, and I understand there are charter schools, I understand there's some old, open enrollment options, but the choice is very, very limited, and in my view, that needs to change. You know, I, I, I guess I disagree. I think. Me, um, in terms of the, the last thing you said, I, I think Minnesota is, is known for an enormous array of choices that parents have for, um, uh, for the programs that their children are enrolled in, the schools they can go to, whether it's magnet schools or charter schools or open enrollment or post-secondary. Um, it, it, we, we have a... Uh, we're known across the country as a state that um, that places a value on um, uh, on on what's called the school choice. Um, I mean, a high value on the on the school choice um, on the school choice uh, uh, movement. And um, certainly, you know, you can't. Everybody can't choose in the whole state to go to school in Randall. That that's not possible. So you have some limits based on uh, how many students you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you can accommodate, and that's that's true in other school districts um, as well. So the, the the choice is not absolute. But my, but my it, point but is, but the program that is is certainly um, 
uh, they're certainly available but, statewide. But my point is there may be programs and this and that, but what we know, and I didn't hear from anybody that testified in front of the Senate Education Committee over the last two years that disagrees with the notion that the best predictor of academic success is whether or not a child can read at grade level in third grade. Right. And the theory behind that is that up until third grade, you almost exclusively learn to read. And at third grade and beyond, you start to read to learn. Right. My point is, if we have schools that, for whatever reason, are taking students of normal intelligence and ability and not training them to read by third grade, if those parents don't have an economically viable way out of that situation, we're doing a horrible disservice to our parents, and it is disproportionately affecting poor people and minorities and limiting access to the American dream, and we need to fix that. Well, and one thing that probably will fix that is the, probably the only thing that I really like about the governor's budget when it comes to K-12 education is the all-day, everyday kindergarten. And I like that very much, and I think that will help in that regard. Other than that, I don't think too much about uh, the whole thing. Well, you've uh, come a long way. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you, Senator yeah, Rest. I have, I have to, to tell you, Senator that. Rest. I have always. Forty-five minutes, and you've converted him. I have, no, <laughs> Senator Rest. I have always supported no, all-day, everyday I know. I'm kindergarten. Just always. Yeah. Uh, uh, my son was one of the very first students to ever participate in all-day, everyday mm -hmm. kindergarten, and, and it was tremendous. And I, it's the right thing to do. Um, but with that. I also want to clarify uh, something that, uh, uh, well, it was just in kind of in passing, but something I said earlier. Now, we talked about the shift, and uh, the shift has been paid back that the uh, Republicans borrowed in their budget. That's all been paid back, plus some of the Democrat budget they borrowed the previous biennium. I just want to clarify that that did take get taken care well, of. We in could our, say in that the they paid back pay what the Democrats borrowed and we still owe what the Republicans And you still, are. no, well, <laughs> we paid the whole no back of no money. No huh? No life all. No life all. No life all. That, money, that money fungibility thing at work here. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, I got a couple of specific questions from viewers that, that have been paying attention to our discussion tonight. And we have a question, we have a comment from a viewer um, who's a county commissioner in southern Minnesota who says, uh, by gosh, uh, our commission has been looking for ways to cut, combine, and reorganize, and then the state uh, cuts aid and, man and mandates yet more services. I want to follow up on that viewer's question because last year there was some talk, I think actually maybe in the last couple of sessions, about mandates and relieving counties and cities of some of the mandates. And speaking as an old city attorney, I can tell you that everything from data practices to who knows what, you know, you've got mandates that come to you from St. Paul. And I, I, there was a League of Minnesota Cities or the Minnesota Association of Counties that had a proposal to deal with reducing some of the mandates. And I'm wondering what happened to that? Is that a topic for discussion this session at all? Anybody know anything about that? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen the, the reduction or the proposal from the League. Uh, even from those of us who appreciate statewide standards as a good, efficient way to model government, even we recognize uh, that there is a bureaucratic creep that is involved in stacking these things on the books year after year. And especially when, when some of them become meaningless um, or are burdensome on commons, we want to recognize and see which ones we can dispense with. But it is at the sacrifice of having uh, statewide standards that we can rely on and be efficient. That's the trade-off. You know, I want to piggyback on something Senator Ress said earlier when she, I thought, made a good point that why would I assume that, boy, those voters are smart, they sent me to St. Paul, but man, they're idiots when they vote for city council. Uh, that's why I oppose a lot of these mandates. That's why I'm not concerned about as much about statewide standards. My assumption, just like with the property taxes that people pay locally, my assumption is these taxes have been levied by folks that were voted in. And interestingly enough, of course, the, the uh, more local you make government, the closer people are to the decision makers. And so I, would, I think the way to answer the property tax problem and, and city tax problems and all sorts of things, get away, you know. We state legislators think we got to make sure that Beltrami County does things like Dakota County. Well, maybe they don't want to. And, you know, the problem with being a politician is to those who have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, and we should not do that. We should let them run their own counties and cities and school boards, back off with the mandates, and they wouldn't have to have such high taxes. Well, we should be mindful also of uh, the local regulations that brought us uh, things as, as crazy and burdensome as rural electrification or uh, as crazy and burdensome as, as upcoming high-speed Internet. We don't need your, your, your newfangled uh, kind of regulations bringing that crazy Internet interwebs out here. I mean, to a certain extent... All those tubes. Uh, all those, so here's the tubes. 
uh, on some level, there can be a benefit to these in the long run that we need to recognize, even if there's a short-term burden. Senator Rest, your thoughts on mandates and that sort of thing? Well, we, we did have um, a, um, a whole string of mandates that we considered giving relief to um, uh, a number of years back. But for as many uh, people that considered something um, a mandate, um, we had other people coming and saying, oh, it's a necessity. And so the, the mandate relief bill that we had um, really was, was fairly weak. And we, um, um, it, it's really a hard, uh, a hard discussion to have because even though we, um, we want um, uh, local governments to have some measure of um, autonomy, the fact of the matter is we also want to make sure that um, a child who lives in um, Hennepin County has access to, um, uh, you know, good fire and police services and protection and so on as much as someone that lives in Sherburne County. And so uh, although there's not a constitutional requirement for um, making sure that an individual, no matter where they live, gets a, gets a uniform education in our state. Uh, we, don't, we don't put that in the Constitution for the kinds of services that we expect from local governments. I, I still think that there's a level of expectation that um, if your house is on fire in one county um, and you, uh, you know, dial 911, you're, you're going to get some service for that. And, and, it, it, um, and you have to pay for it, but um, that we do have that that expectation. So the mandate or the mandate discussion is a, a very difficult one um, because we really do have to look at the things that are um, a burden that uh, we should not ask the local governments to pay in the same way that the federal government passes on mandates to the state like uh, funding special education and they don't send the money. That's right, send 20% of the right. money. And we don't send the money, but you know what? We're still going to be providing special education services to the children of Minnesota. And I find it funny how state legislators think it's just a disgrace when the federal government gives a little money and a mandate and doesn't fully fund it, but when we do it to the counties, that's just making sure there are uniform standards. A viewer from Farmington wants to talk about a different topic, and I think this might be in your wheelhouse, Senator Rest, given the committees you serve on. This viewer wants to know whether the primary election will be moved to June. Well, there are a, there are a number of, um, I think there are going to be a number of proposals coming through the uh, election subcommittee. Uh, one of them will certainly be proposed, that will be proposed is a uh, an earlier primary than the August one. You know, we moved the September primary to August. Um, because of the um, Federal Overseas um, Voting Act, the federal government required us to have a certain period of time between elections so that we could send absentee ballots to uh, members of the military serving overseas. And um, um, we've only done that once or twice now, but um, it is, um, uh, it's still being looked at as, as whether uh, it's better to have a longer period for the general election uh, campaign than it is to have the the part the the uh, candidates within our parties fighting one another for to to win the primary over a longer period of time. So I think you're going to see that. The point I would make about it is either that and some other election uh, administration initiatives that are going to be coming forward that. Uh, Governor Dayton has been as adamant as um, Governor Pawlenty in saying that he will not sign legislation that does not have a strong bipartisan vote uh, in the legislature. He's not going to sign partisan legislation uh, regarding election administration, and I applaud him for that and also former Governor Pawlenty. Senator Thompson. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot to say about the June primary. I hadn't thought a lot about it until I got here, and in, in fact, I, I find it really interesting how incredibly passionate legislators are about that issue, 
And, you know, obviously... Either the, one side or the other. Yes, no, right. yeah, very right. much on both sides. And, of course, the trade-off is, as Senator Ress said, if you move the primary earlier, you have a little more time for the general election campaign. I think, frankly, a lot of legislators worry that if you move the primary up, it gets closer to the end of session and makes it more difficult to fight off a primary challenge. Well, that's exactly my point. I, I, I do not support a June primary. And I like right where it is. Uh, it's unfortunate that the voters don't take advantage of it and participate in it the way they should. I think we had a little better participation when it was in September. Why, I don't know. Maybe kids are back in school. It's vacations, not summer vacations, summer, all yeah. those kinds Nothing of things. Happens Nothing happens in Minnesota that, in August. That's I think right. That yeah. might be the answer. We would be, uh, it, it, you know, we would be out of compliance with a federal mandate. Yep. That's right. Yep. You know, yep. let's keep that in I mind understand. that I support. Yep. I want the military folks in Afghanistan. Sure. I, I, no I support that, there, too. I, I just wish that... Uh, People to be able participate to and get out there and vote in the primary. When, when, uh, but uh, I do know when that... When Representative uh, Lesh is in his military duty, if it happens to be in election time, he should be able to vote absentee and sure. get that at a, the a time reasonable time. The one time I didn't vote since I was 18 years old was I spent a year at Fort Benning over the course of the last three. It was when I was at Fort Benning. And I, and I tried as best I could, but it's such a pain with the the lag of the military and mail and everything, I was really surprised at how difficult it was. And they have posters. You walk into the chow hall, they got posters. Hey, if you want, you got your voting assistance and all this stuff. Forget about it. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a good move either way. Our, if nothing else, our, our uh, people who are serving should be voting because they have a substantial stake in it. Uh, we only have about a minute left. Um, viewer from Montevideo is concerned about the cigarette tax increase. This viewer doesn't think it's a good idea. Another viewer is concerned about uh, we should be taxing maybe alcohol more than cigarettes. Uh, is there going to be a cigarette tax increase very quickly? Well, it's in the governor's budget, 94 cents on a pack of cigarettes. So there's already almost $2 on a pack of cigarettes. It hurts the lower income folks more than anybody. And, and we will be hearing a, a bill by, by a Republican senator to, uh, to raise the, the tobacco tax even higher. Um, uh, this coming That's week. That's absolutely asinine. The, the, gov the governor has historically opposed the cigarette tax because of its in regressivity, and he ended up putting up in his budget for various other reasons, but at the end of the day, we have to come together and ensure that uh, we have a full package. It's That's a why horrible did. tax. It's, if you're doing it for tax reasons, it's a bad tax. If we think we ought to make people quit smoking, then make it illegal. All right. We have, uh, we've reached the end of our program this evening. I want to thank our panel for uh, your responses. We've had a great discussion. I really appreciate your participation. I want to thank you, the viewers, for participating. Some questions we didn't get to. Next week, we'll get to those. Join us next week and all the weeks that follow for the upcoming programs of your legislature. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans.